Magandang umaga. I share with you in the Tagalog language of the Philippines a greeting of good morning. I do so recognizing that there are many of my friends in the Philippines who watch these weekly worship videos online. And I come to you with the campus of the University of the Philippines located in Los Baños in the province of Laguna as the backdrop to my introduction and welcome this day. It was on this campus where I completed my senior year of high school as a Rotary Exchange student to the Philippines in 1978 and 79. For those who may be tuning in for the first time, my name is Mark Mullins, and I come to you as pastor of the First Christian Church in Pendleton, Oregon. I'm blessed to be able to share with you in these online worship services, and I'm thankful that you've decided to join me in this worship experience. Our call to worship and opening prayer will be shared with us by Chris and Cheryl Rush. Chris and Cheryl have been members of the Pendleton First Christian Church family for the past few years, and they recently moved to Texas, where they are closer to family. And while I miss them terribly, and many of our church family miss them, I'm grateful, so grateful that though many miles separate us from Oregon to Texas, we still share in worship together by means of the technology that is available to us through the Internet. So, Chris and Cheryl, welcome, and thank you for your part in leading us in these opening moments of worship today. Howdy from Amarillo, Texas. Please join us in our call to worship. Our God is a mighty fortress. The Lord is our rock and our deliverer, the one in whom we seek sanctuary. The Lord is our shield where we find safety and refuge. Let us call upon the Lord, who is worthy of all our praises. Let us worship our most amazing, loving, and kind God. Please join me in prayer. Holy God, the stories of the saints throughout all the ages come to us as a gift, for it is through them that we have learned the meaning of faith. We receive this gift with thanks and praise. We are grateful for their example, for showing us the way, for challenging us to continue to live faithful lives. Help us persevere in times such as these, so that when life gets tough and trials affect us, we will find strength to prevent us from growing weary from the challenges we face. May the peace of Christ renew us as we fix our eyes on him. This we pray in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Song. Join me in singing the Lord's Prayer. In the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, verses 31 through 46, Jesus reminds us that there are many who need to know a caring touch and the love of Christ. Jesus tells us that whenever we feed someone who is hungry, we do the same for him. Our Lord tells us that whenever we give someone who is thirsty a refreshing, cool drink, we do the same for him. Jesus tells us that whenever we welcome a stranger in for fellowship, we do the same for him. Christ tells us that whenever we provide clothing for someone who is in need of some, we do the same for him. 
Our Lord tells us that whenever we take care of those who are sick, we do the same for him. And Jesus tells us that whenever we visit or write to someone in prison, we do the same for him. We may not all have the opportunity to serve Jesus in all of these ways I've mentioned from scripture, but the financial gifts we contribute to the church certainly help others do such good deeds in Christ's name, both near and far away. Thank you for your good and faithful gifts, for through them you help support and just and sustain ministry that serves others in the name of Jesus. Please join me in prayer. Merciful God, you have shown us the true meaning of generosity, blessing us with abundance and sharing even your own son with us. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of your work of peace and redemption in this world. We ask that you bless our contributions and use them to further your purposes in our lives and in the lives of others. In the name of Christ, we offer our gifts, and in the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. I read of an old man who was known to be a man accustomed to respect. He had been a company commander in the army. Tough as nails and straight as an arrow, he was a man whom duty was familiar word and honor with him. Not only had he served honorably in the army as a commander, but even more, he served faithfully as a husband to his wife. And the way in which he honored his wife was notable indeed. In his old age, his eyes no longer permitted him to drive. So his wife would take him to their favorite restaurant. When they arrived, she would sit in the driver's seat until he pulled his legs out of the car, pushed his cane into the pavement, and slowly rose to his feet. She would watch with apprehension as he carefully came around the car to open the door for her. It was a gesture that some may think demeaning to a woman, but for him and her both, it was a gesture of honor and love. Gestures, gestures are a vocabulary without words. We use gestures in many ways. We express anger and hatred with them. We also use gestures to express enthusiasm and support. We use gestures to convey honor as when we stand for our national anthem. We use them like an old man to show love and respect. Communion is a gesture in itself. By this gesture, we show support for the family of God. It says, as it demonstrated by Jesus Christ, I belong to God's family. By this gesture of communion, we remember the gift of life that comes through Jesus, and we honor God with our spirits of thanksgiving. By this gesture of communion, we express our thanks for what Jesus did when he willfully gave himself to the cross. We remember and are grateful for his sacrifice. We who are Christians take communion until Christ returns bringing with him all those who trust him, all those who have committed themselves to follow him and abide in the will of God. In eating the bread, we recall these words of our Savior who said, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. And drinking from the cup, we remember these words of Jesus, drink of this all of you, for this is my blood which is poured out for the forgiveness of many sins. Please join me in prayer. Dear God, we come to you today to praise and glorify your name. You have showered us with wonderful gifts. The best gift of all is the gift of your love and grace as demonstrated through Jesus Christ. Loving Creator, you have been unselfish and very giving, even to those who have since turned their backs on you. We pray that all people everywhere will come to your welcoming arms. 
We dedicate this prayer to those who need someone to call out when the days get rough and the nights are worse. Give them the wisdom, the strength, and courage to come to you, O God. Following Jesus has wonderfully changed our lives. May they be the same for all the people everywhere as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 27. I'll read that text from the New Living Translation of the Bible. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we will all share that same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmonious, for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. As I record this message with the Lincoln Memorial scene behind me, here in the United States both the Democratic and Republican National Conventions have concluded. Americans are less than 10 weeks away from the 2020 presidential election. Earlier this past week I published an article in my church's newsletter and in that column I said this, as we consider our vote, it's important that we keep ourselves educated and informed about the issues that are at the forefront of concern for our nation as well as ourselves. We are living in a time of extraordinary challenge. Throughout the world, people are aware of the difficulties associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Earlier this year, in Pendleton, Oregon, where I live, we experienced the devastation of an historic flood of the Umatilla River during the first week of February. Before we were even recovered from the effects of that flood, the harsh reality of the coronavirus impacted the United States. Just four weeks earlier, on January 9th, the World Health Organization reported 59 initial cases in Wuhan, China. Eleven days later, three additional cases of what had become known as the 2019 Novel Coronavirus were reported in Thailand and Japan. This prompted the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to begin screenings at JFK International Airport, San Francisco International Airport, and Los Angeles International Airport. The first case of COVID-19 in the United States was reported on January 21st in Washington State, just to the north of us here in Oregon. A resident of Washington was the first person in the U.S. with a confirmed case of the virus, having returned from Wuhan one week earlier. Just two days after that report, 
On January 23rd, 13 more people died from the virus and an additional 300 were sickened, causing China to make the unprecedented move to close off Wuhan and its population of 11 million people. Much has happened in the seven months since then. As of August 27th, there have been over 24 million COVID cases throughout the world. Nearly 6 million or one quarter of those in the United States alone. Closer to my home in Umatilla County, 2,594 cases of the coronavirus have been reported, resulting in 35 deaths. Across the globe, more than 827,000 deaths have occurred. I know that there are a number of people who watch these weekly worship videos from various places throughout the world. While I'm not directly aware of what may be happening in other nations or in your specific location, I do know that those of us in these United States are challenged on many fronts. The United States populace is exceedingly diverse, which makes it difficult to communicate and deal with many of the problems that confront us. Our leadership at national, state, and local levels reflects this diversity. COVID-19 understandably is of grave concern, but it's not the only issue that we face. Health care, immigration, education, environment, finance and spending, poverty and welfare, national security, military, and foreign policy, all these and more confront and challenge us as a society. Most recently, concern for the safety of children, young adults, and educators has caused many schools throughout our nation to transition quickly to online learning. Precisely how to do this and still maintain essential and effective educational processes is at the forefront of concern. You see, not all children are equipped to take part in online schooling, and not all parents or guardians are able to remain at home or afford appropriate child care to ensure that their children get the most out of such an educational offering as online learning. I don't mean to sound dismal in my remarks, but I feel it's necessary to identify and communicate key issues in order that we best address and deal with them. Ignoring the situation that confronts us is neither a good approach nor an ideal option. Taking a stand for what one believes is important. To do so diplomatically and respectfully is essential to the health and well-being of any population group. These days it seems that diplomacy and respect have been clouded over by the rants and rages of those who seem to care little, if at all, for the welfare of all. I'd like to clarify what I need to say. And I ask you, please, please, Listen to everything I have to say and don't tune me out before I have had the opportunity to finish. One of the issues that we are confronted with in the United States at this time is the issue of race and racial inequality. Associated with this is the issue of justice. Black lives do matter. It's important that those of us who claim to follow Jesus Christ understand, accept, and stand up for this truth. Many listening to this message can recall a song that we were taught at an early age in Sunday school. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Black lives matter. They matter to Jesus Christ, and they must matter to those of us who claim to follow Jesus Christ. And also, I must say, red lives matter. Yellow lives matter. Olive-skinned lives matter, and any other color group, including white lives, all matter to God. And they must matter to those of us who claim ourselves to be people of God. For me to say all lives matter doesn't mean that I don't recognize the inequality that has existed and continues to exist in our country toward black lives 
or brown lives or any color one might consider oneself or another to be. Inequality and injustice exist across the color spectrum. Inequality and injustice impacts us all, albeit some more than others. And in these past many months, we've become much more aware of how black and brown lives have suffered under inequality and injustice. And as Christians, we are compelled by the example and spirit of Jesus to stand up against inequality and injustice, no matter what form it may take. Addressing the church in Corinth in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians in the Bible, the Apostle Paul speaks metaphorically about the makeup of the church. Paul very well could have been addressing the makeup of our country at this particular time. Listen again to what the Apostle Paul says in verses 18 through 22. Our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. Think about humankind in the manner of this metaphor that Paul uses. Think of humankind in the form of a human body. The body has many parts and no two parts look exactly the same. Humanity has many parts and no two parts look exactly the same. God has put each part just where God wants that part to be. And just as the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you, one person of one color should never say to another person of another color, I don't need you. One person of one color should never say to another person of a different color, you're worth nothing. The fact is, we are all worth everything to God. So much so that God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to this life so that all could be saved so that all could enjoy the gift of life, life blessed more abundantly here on earth by the presence of the Holy Spirit and eternally with God through the gift that God provided in Jesus. Paul wrote that in fact, and I quote, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. We do best to remember that the next time any one of us is tempted to label, libel, judge, ridicule, or demean another person who appears different from ourselves. And I'd like to say one more thing before I close. It has to do with an issue that I'll call black and blue. I'm not really qualified to speak on behalf of either group that I'm about to highlight, because I've never walked in the shoes of either one. But I do have an informed opinion. And I believe my opinion has balance, even if it's not derived from first-hand experience. Consider the color of the uniform that most police officers wear. Blue. It seems to me that when we discriminatingly label and judge those who have been sworn to serve and protect in society, when we cast harsh and destructive judgment toward all who wear the uniform of a police officer, we err. And we grieve and we hurt both the spirit and image of God, as well as the men, women, and their families who wear the uniform and badge that is associated with that uniform. I don't deny that the system of policing needs some serious reconstruction. But I do believe we are wrong if we judge all police officers as bad. I know for a fact that there are many, many wonderful and good police officers serving in my town, in this state, throughout this nation, and in other places throughout the world. And now, consider the color of one's skin. For those who are black, I can only imagine the hardships such people have faced. And my imagination indeed is but an obscure picture of what black people may experience or do experience. 
or people of any color who have been discriminated against and treated unfairly, unjustly, and even harshly with cruelty. For me, the Apostle Paul sums it up quite well when in verses 24 through 26 of today's text he writes, God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for the member the harmony among the members, so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. People, friends, we do well to keep in mind our responsibility as Christians to stand up and speak out against injustice, even if it means risking our own safety, security, and reputation. Please, join me in an excerpt of a prayer written by Elizabeth Caton, who is an Episcopal priest in the Diocese of Newark, New Jersey. Dear God, this new day has dawned with this country more divided than it has been since the days of the Civil War. Half of your people are rejoicing, while the other half are stunned and sore afraid. What divided us then continues to tear at the seams of the fabric of this nation. We are a united, divided states. Help us to remember that the experiment called democracy is not over. It is still being tested. After 240 years of existence, the final results are not yet in. We still have work to do. It stretches out before us, across wheat fields and deserts, from the mountains to the prairies, from sea to shining sea. In the midst of the sense, our sense of victory, help us to remember your call to us to love one another as you love us. In the midst of our sense of defeat, help us to remember that you still reign. You alone are worshipped. You alone are God. Help us to put aside our own feelings, jumbled and confused as they may be at the moment, in service of others, our families, our friends, and neighbors, here and around the world. Help us remember your high calling to us to be agents of forgiveness and reconciliation, love and peace, healing and hope in a world made dark by fear and hatred and brokenness. Help us to rebuild this nation by seeking out your image in the face of others, finding the best in us to serve those who are the least, the lost, and the lonely. Help us to remember the words of one of your servants of old, who reminded us that perfect love casts out fear. Help us perfect our love. We are your people. May we find strength in our diversity, and seek the courage to live into what is written on every piece of currency in this nation. In God we trust. In God we trust. For only in you can we live in safety. Only in you will we find justice. Only in you will we know the peace that passes all human understanding. In the name of Christ Jesus. Amen.